Hello and welcome to a new car review video on the channel. Today we're looking at a modern classic, which is quite rare here in the UK. It's a 2002 Renault Aventime. So if we start with the name then, Renault Aventime, it is a portmanteau. And I had to look that up on Google as well, but it basically means bringing two words together. Avant from French meaning ahead, and obviously time from English meaning time. So the Avon Time was first shown at the Louvre in Paris in 1999 to the public, uh, but it does bear a lot of resemblance to the Val Satis com uh, concept that was shown a few years before. So after the press launch at the Louvre, there was the public launch at Geneva Motor Show that year. And that's where it was referred to as the Cooper Spass, mixing the word coupe with a spass. It was a couple of years until it went into production because there were a number of engineering issues with the pillarless coupe design. The design was by Patrick Lequimon, who's a well-known Renault designer, and his motto was design equals quality. So the idea behind the Avon Time was for people who'd owned uh, Espaces over the years and they'd got older, their children had grown up, but they still wanted the high riding and high driving position of an Espace, but with a more luxury design. That was the thought, but whether they actually asked anybody if that's what they wanted, I'm not actually sure. So part of the idea around the design was to get Renault back into the luxury market. Matra, who built this for Renault, had built the three previous generations of the Espace but Renault had decided to move that in-house. So because Renault had decided to take the production of the main Espace away, this was kind of seen by some people as a bit of a consolation prize for Matra to carry on producing an MPV type vehicle. But the idea actually came and was conceived by Matra themselves. So the design used the idea of the galvanized load bearing structure from the first generations of the Espace mated together with non-load bearing aluminium and composite panels. So underneath it uses a lot of components, 50% in fact, from the third generation of SPAS. So up front you've got the silky smooth, uh, well used 3 litre V6 Renault engine, uh, linked to a silky smooth wafty automatic gearbox. So as well as the wafty drivetrain, you've got a very soft and supple suspension. So it really does give a nice kind of compliant ride. You've got these big, comfy luxury seats as well. So it's, I've used the word wafty quite a lot, but it, it's really uh, nice to sort of waft along and it's a very sort of comfortable and armchair type place to be. So even though the height was a bit of a feature for, um, for the, the design, uh, the, the, the high driving height, similar to the Espace, it does feel very high up. Uh, that does emphasize uh, the sort of wallowiness of the uh, suspension. So it is quite unusual and takes a bit of getting used to. At the time, Matra and Renault didn't really see that this car had any competition. Um, and I suppose you can see why, because it is a quite a unique proposition. But unfortunately the target market didn't really see it that way and they sort of went straight for the sort of regular usual luxury uh, cars like BMWs and Mercedes or anything that was being offered by the Germans. Uh, even downsizing as well rather than still buying into this sort of large uh, luxury feel. You could say in a way it was ahead of its time because now with luxury SUVs this is a sort of a proposition that's become a little bit more commonplace. So all oven times came in this lovely two-tone paintwork and this is kind of the classic uh, sort of launch colour if you like, this blue and silver. But they also did a lovely apple green metallic and silver which I think is a little bit rarer uh, but is really a, a really nice looking colour. So this, the most striking aspects of the design are these double kinematic doors. They're an enormous door and they don't open that wide either because obviously they couldn't and they've got this really interesting uh, hinge arrangement. Some of the most striking features as well are the, uh, the, the panoramic roof and the uh, pillarless uh, windows on the side. 
So just one button here opens the roof uh, all the way back and the windows as well to give you what Renault called the open air experience. In the back, you can seat three people, but really it is more of a two plus two. It's much more comfortable if there's just the two of you, despite it being a really large car. Uh, they called it also as well theatre seating because they're that little bit higher than the front seat, so it gives you a really nice panoramic view out the front, even from the back. A bit of a downside, considering it's such a massive car as well, is there's not an awful lot of legroom back there. Sales of the Aventine were poor, particularly in the UK, uh, and it wasn't helped by Renault bringing out another luxury but more conventional car called the Valsatis. Um, and even in the UK, Renault de dealers didn't do that well with that either, and the dealers joked at calling it the Valstatic because it never moved out of the showrooms. They were built from 2001 to 2003, and they built about 8,500 of them, and that's nothing in terms of modern car manufacture. They only, came, only about 400 came to the UK, and if you look on howmanyleft.com, there's only about 160 left in the UK. One of the reasons why there's not many left is because if you have any kind of accident in these, and even if you get some glass damaged and things like that, parts are really hard to come by, so they just get written off by insurance companies. Another problem is, is because obviously of the 8,500, more of them are in Europe, a lot of the British cars get sort of um, taken a, uh, back to Europe and then used for parts. In Europe, cars tend to hold their value a little bit more, so when the price is bottomed out here, that's when a lot of them disappeared as parts cars to Europe. This particular model is the Privilege spec model, which is the highest spec model, and it has the 3.0-litre 24-valve, as I mentioned, V6 Renault engine, with 207 horsepower. The engine was shared with the Peugeot 406 Coupe, and it's similar to the engine in the Clio V6 as well. So this car has got the uh, automatic gearbox in it. You could get a four-cylinder engine and a manual gearbox as well, but I think really this Woftomatic really does suit this car. I can't imagine changing gear. And also the gear change on the manual cars was a little bit like a transit. I think, don't think it was particularly refined. So yeah, for this big Woft Woftmobile, I think it certainly suits the automatic. This particular car is a well-used example. Uh, the owner has had it for 10 years. It had about 60,000 miles on it when, it, uh, when he bought it, and it's got about 140, uh, 143 on it now. You might have noticed it's got a tow bar as well, and it's not super pristine, but it's still in good condition. It's got that problem that you get in like Hoovy's garage Lamborghinis. It's got the, the old sticky buttons thing, which a lot of, a lot of sort of 90s and 2000 cars have these days. But I think it does show that it is pretty durable. It gets used, it gets driven, and it's still going strong. And it does feel very comfortable still. It's not crashy, and things feel reasonably well screwed together. All the electric windows still work. The climate control has been regassed, and that all works well as well. So there's nothing. There's no dead pixels on the uh, on the speedometer or anything like that. So it's kind of the workhorse for the owner's sort of car collections. A lot of classic cars get towed with it, and it's taken abroad to pick up different classic cars and things like that. And it's shown itself to be pretty reliable. It is quite a unique place to be as well. It's very airy. You've got a lot of glass around you. Um, the dashboard seems like it's a mile away. It is quite difficult to see the corners, although it does have parking sensors on the rear. So that takes a little bit of getting used to because it drops away and you can't see uh, the front end at all. But I think as a, as a place to be, it's very high up. You've got a commanding driving position, which is what they were going for. And it does feel quite luxury for a Renault. You've got that slightly Jaguar feeling about it, but there's still no mistaking that you're in a slightly quirky French car. So the leather, it's funny I should mention Jaguar, it, the, the leather is actually from a company called Bridge of Weir that supply Aston Martin's leather. I think it's held up pretty well, it, although it's looking a little bit sort of uh, worn and, uh, and dry now, but not too bad considering how old the car is. 
if you, I don't know if you're old like me, but if you can remember earlier versions of Top Gear, Clarkson put it on the cool wall, if you remember that, if anybody remembers that, and he put it in the Sub-Zero section. So, and I can understand why, because it has got a lot of personality and a lot of individuality about it, and the design is really striking, even today. I think because it has that striking, unusual look that you don't see every day, it's actually appeared in quite a few movies where people who choose the, the sort of special effects or the, uh, the things, the cars that are going to appear in movies, choose things that don't look every day and have a really interesting or futuristic personality to them. So this featured in Children of Men and it, you can also see them in the background on Ready Player One as well. So, Going back to the Top Gear mention, they did an article where they looked into if you could tune up a car or add parts to a car to make anything racy, and they actually chose a Renault Aventine to do that and got quicker and quicker lap times out of it, which I'm sure was an interesting venture, but I think the heart of this car is, as I've mentioned several times, the sort of waftability. I think the owner of this car who uses it for towing and going long distances has got it just right because I think that's what it is. It's a long distance cruiser that you can feel very, very comfortable in, have a fair amount of space, a fair amount of reliability and also really good towing ability as well. So what are my final thoughts on the Renault Aventine then? I think it is a modern classic, and that was kind of the question that I posed at the start. Is it a modern classic? And I think it definitely is. And one of the reasons, if, if, only, if there was only one reason for that, is the, the rarity of it. The fact that there are so few of these around now obviously makes it part of that. I think the story, the story is interesting as well. The whole Renault and Matra connection and the sort of evolution of where it came from is really interesting and its construction and the strange use of materials and the, and the sort of handmade nature of it makes it uh, makes for something that is a modern classic. I think another aspect of it that makes it a modern classic is the uniqueness of the design. I think Matra and Renault, they didn't see any competitors and when you think about it, who else makes a massive uh, MPV two-door vehicle? Nobody. Um, I think one of the things if you're going to buy one of these is you've probably got to buy the best that you can afford and then also maybe buy a bit of a beta to have as spares as well because things are going to go wrong. I think also you need to track down a specialist and an expert to help you maintain it because there is a lot to go wrong but I think if you fight, you know, get that partnership with a specialist that's close to you I think then hopefully you'll be okay. okay. This particular car lives in Leicester and the owner uses a specialist based in Nottingham so he's quite lucky that he's got a specialist quite close by who knows Renault Aventimes inside out. Whether that will be the case with you certainly something worth considering before you buy to see if you can find a specialist which you know isn't at the other end of the country. Like most sort of older modern classics there's a great forum and owners club online and lots of people who will be happy to point you in the right direction for those uh, rare spares and also people who can help you maintain the car. But one of the things make sure the rear lights aren't broken because they're 600 pounds each. Well I hope you've enjoyed this video and I've really enjoyed my time with the Renault Aventime. It's a really kind of quirky and interesting car. But anyway, thank you very much for watching. Please like and subscribe if you get the chance and hit the notification bell so you get a notification of when I've made a new video, if you like this kind of content. Thanks again, bye for now.